Thanks, Brandon. <clears throat> well, again, good morning. Good to see you all. Good to be able to worship with you and to be able to come before God's Word as a, as a community. Uh, and so today we are looking at laws. This is kind of like law, laws again. We're going back. It's laws part two. Uh, we had it last week as we went through the Ten Commandments. Um, and so we kind of worked through that. And, and this week we're uh, continuing that theme. And sometimes the laws aren't uh, always the most fun to talk about. Again, not always two weeks in a row. Uh, but like we talked last week, laws display the character of God. They display his values. They display what he cares about. They're not just a list of arbitrary do's and don'ts, even though sometimes, as Rob was sharing, uh, sometimes that's what it feels like when you're a kid. They're just arbitrary do's and don'ts. Right? Yet sometimes when we come to passages like these, we can overly lean into the notion or the idea of our freedom in Christ. Why do we even need these laws? They're so old. Right? They're so archaic. They're so ancient. I'm a New Testament Christian. Right? I don't need these old things anymore. We have freedom in Christ, which sometimes we think gives us like this license to kind of live however we want, do what we want, as long as we're doing what we think might be right. And then suddenly, like subtly, we can, um, or maybe even outright sometimes, think the laws of God are more like outdated laws of our society or communities. These are real laws that have actually been put in place and as of a couple of years ago are still true for some communities. Think about these laws for a second. In West Virginia, it's against the law to eat candy less than an hour and a half before a church service. We would fail that miserably, right? Like we would not make it work, right? It's a law, hour and a half before church, you can't do it, right? Think about closer to us in Winona Lake, Wisconsin. It's illegal to eat ice cream at a counter on Sundays. It's a real law, it's still in place. You can't order a cherry pie a la mode in Kansas City on the Lord's Day. Can't get it on Sundays, anywhere, apparently. I think that's weird. Then on the other hand, Illinois still doesn't allow a dog owner to give a lighted cigar to its pet. Now, I don't know about you guys, that seems ridiculous. Why can't I not give a cigar to my pet? Right, but that's kind of what we sometimes feel like as it comes to some of these laws, like they're so old, like I don't own a donkey, I don't own an ox, I don't own a field, like what are these about? Like I want you to see today, I hope that we can see that these laws are more than that, right? There's a greater sense to the heart of who God is in their goodness to us individually, but also as a community. So that's what I hope we'll find today. Let's pray as we come to God's word. Lord God, we do come to you now. Uh, we ask, uh, Lord, that you would guide our time together, that we would guide our time in your word. And Lord, these rules and laws can, can feel heavy and feel overwhelming and sometimes even monotonous for us, but Lord, help us to see your holiness and your goodness and even your grace this morning in them, but even more so in your son, Jesus, who is our righteousness. And it is in his name we do pray. Amen. Well, again, like I said, <clears throat> we are in the aftermath of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments came right there in chapter 20, and now we're kind of taking 21 to 24 all in this big chunk here. Sometimes this section is called the Book of the Covenant, so he's kind of developing more of the laws that kind of flow out of the Ten Commandments in some ways, like how it's applied to our life. So taking the Ten Commandments and like this is what it looks like to live these things out and how we live. Chapters 20 to 24 walk through many of these laws. And to take these sections as a whole, uh, it means that we're not going to go into every single piece of all of the laws. If you were to read 21 to 24, uh, there's much more in there than what I put in your worship guide. And I would encourage you to read them. I think uh, they're interesting to read. And I think, again, they bring out more uh, of God's heart. And God's word is always good for us to engage with. And so I'm not taking them out because I don't believe God's word is good. It's just a matter of the amount of time that we have this morning. For our purposes, we're taking a higher level view of these chapters. And honestly, most of the rest of Exodus is going to work out uh, in a similar fashion for us. You see, each of these laws, though very old, are still very valuable to us. Some may not apply in the exact way as uh, they would have in that time, as most of us, like I said, don't own an ox or a donkey or have fields or slaves or land. Uh, but the principles still hold true for us. 
um, they're still important to us. And sometimes within our denomination and in the historic uh, Presbyterian uh, route, uh, they had a, a concept called the general equity of a law. Uh, so or the general equity of moral principles. And so though these things don't still hold true, the general equity of them still is very true and real for us morally. I'll walk through that for us uh, as we go. I think it will make sense, but I hope you can see that there's a heart here to these laws that are still really important for us to hear, uh, to see, and then to live out uh, because they're at the heart of who God is. This morning, we're going to walk through our text guarded by three questions I think will help us understand and help us continue in faith in Christ. One, what do good laws promote and protect? What do good laws promote and protect? The second question is what happens when we break these laws? Like what, what happens when I break them, which is inevitably going to happen? And then the third question, how do these laws relate to our relationship with God? Like how do these laws relate with our relationship with God? And before we get into these questions, I think it's important we walk through something that uh, may be a bit of a recap from last week, but I think is very important for us nonetheless. Remember that if God is eternal, that if he's the creator, if he made all things and sustains all things, uh, then his, his rules and how he wants us to live is also ultimately good, right? Like Rob talked about up here, like these rules, uh, even if it's flossing and you're married to a dentist, it's for your good, um, or like the rules we have in place in our own home uh, are meant for our good. We're still broken people. Uh, and so sometimes my laws and my rules in my own home, I don't have laws, by the way, uh, the rules I have in my home uh, can be tainted by my own sin. And so it's, it's a mixture, though I want it to always be good for them, it can still be sometimes a mix in my life, yet not with God. Okay, so that's where these are a little bit different than the rules and laws we have in our world and even in our own home. That's not the way... It is with God. So as he's good, eternal creator, we can know that he is giving us good laws and they can be for us that we might live well, right? That's the goal. That's the ultimate end of his laws, that we might live well, the best ways to live. So let's jump into our first question. What do good laws promote and protect? Well, laws are always doing something and they're always speaking about something uh, in a society for a people. The laws about not eating candy before going to worship in West Virginia speak about their value of especially probably kids, but sometimes adults, not having a sugar rush as they come to worship, right? And having trouble sitting. It can be hard to do that no matter what age you are, but they want you to be able to sit. They value worship. Laws from Winona Lake about eating ice cream at a counter uh, speak about that ice cream is not necessary on a Sunday as it relates to the Lord's Day and Sabbath. You don't need to go in somewhere, have someone working when they should be resting on that day, especially as it relates to ice cream. Although ice cream is pretty tasty, right? The laws are because they value the Sabbath. They value rest, right? And this is true of our society too. Think about speed limits in our world, right? There's someone out there. I don't know who. I don't know how they come up with it. But they come up with the idea of speed limits. And sometimes they feel arbitrary, but oftentimes they're for our good, right? So we think about speed limits in school zones, and it gets real low, right? It gets real low. Why does it get real low? Well, because there's kids, and there's a lot of kids, and kids don't, what, pay attention, right? And so they're walking around, and then you're like me when I was four, I got hit by a car, right? And you can, it can happen, and it's, it's, it's a bummer. Uh, and it can be really dangerous. Uh, and so we have those rules because we value life. We don't want anyone to die by hitting getting hit by a car. So it's very obvious for us, but again, we have to see rules this way some, and laws this way because sometimes we see them as um, kind of ridiculous. So as we look at these laws in these chapters, what do we learn? Like, what do we see promoted? What do we see protected? I think there's a few things that we should highlight as we look at the rules that I have in your liturgy guide, but also as the whole of them. First thing that we see is that people are made in the image of God. Like the, the image of God in people, made in people, uh, is a huge reality as it relates to the rules and the laws of God. And people, period, are made in the image of God. See, some of these laws in these sections address all of these different types of people. So think about it. They address slaves. 
It addresses children. It addresses parents. It addresses sojourners that are coming into the land. It addresses the poor, the farmers, injured people injured by animals, uh, and those taken advantage of by a variety or various amounts of scenarios. All of these people are spoken to in these laws. Yet in each of these scenarios, the value of people time and again is made clear. You can see it in a few of the sections that I put in there for you. Look at chapter 21, verse 2. Now, technically, the Hebrews were not supposed to take Hebrew slaves. They weren't supposed to take each other as slaves. But if it was for a debt to be paid off or from poverty, uh, you could become essentially a servant of another. Yet that doesn't mean it is to be treated inhumanely or like an animal. You see this after six years he is to be free, right? You pay off your debt and you're free. There is a, always a sense of release and always a sense of freedom for this person. And then so this notion like follows like a variety of laws that we see that God has overarching throughout his like the, the year of Jubilee, the laws of redemption, the foundational parts of who God is, that he is a God who releases and frees that which is enslaved. I think we've already seen this, right? In Exodus, right? If we go back a couple chapters, like it's just who God is that he releases, that he frees. People are made in the image of God and these laws are shaped in a way that we would honor that. Second thing we see uh, in these laws is that restitution is part of justice. I'll explain what that looks like, because we have an idea of what that means in our world. It may not be exactly what it means in the Bible. There are lots of laws about a variety of situation in these passages, and one of the recurring themes is that of the idea of your donkey, or spe specifically your ox, and how it would uh, deal with itself, basically, and how it handles itself, right? So ultimately, the owner in these scenarios is responsible for that animal. And it is considered part of his livelihood. It's like a work, it's like vocation, part of their work life. So for example, you see there in Exodus 21, 33 to 34, there's this scenario where a man digs a pit and he leaves it open. We don't know why he digs a pit and it doesn't really matter, right? The pit's there and it's open. It's not a good call, right? And he doesn't cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls in it. It says that the owner of the pit shall make restoration, the idea is restitution, same idea, for his negligence in leaving the pit open. Like, he's responsible, and he should make it right. That's the point of these laws. Like, you're responsible for your negligence, and you should make it right. So he's to pay the full price of the dead animal, and as a bonus, he gets the dead animal. Yay, you get a dead animal in a pit. Congratulations, right? See, there's another scenario that's not in there in verses 35 to 36. It states that if a man's ox butts another ox so that it dies, then they shall together sell the profits of the ox and share its priced, price. And also the dead beast they will share. So there's a, there's a unity among these animals that they would then share. But if the ox has been known to gore other animals, it's already, it's got a reputation, right? It's coming with a reputation, right? And he's not, the owner doesn't keep it in. He shall repay ox for ox. Like he's giving a working ox for the dead one. Like again, these are about, why are these laws here? Why is restitution important? Because these laws are for a community, right? These laws are that, that people would stay in community with one another and that they weren't, aren't just living for yourself, that you're living for the betterment and the good of another in community together. Community is more important than personal vindication or even our own personal rights as it relates to God's law. So first, people are made in the image of God. Second, restitution is part of justice as it relates to God's laws. And then third, we still see grace. We still see grace in these laws, that grace is still a part of of these, chapter 22 talks about the sojourner coming into the land, coming into the land, and God's people are not to oppress them, though they have no right to that land. They have no right to what's going on to the Hebrews, to the Israelites. 
Why? Because God reminds them that yet they were once sojourners themselves in the land of Egypt. So too the people are to care for those sojourners that come into their land. And so God goes even further. What's another category that we see grace here in these laws? We see grace as it relates to the treatment of widows and the fatherless, the fatherless children. So these folks in the society would have only been taking, right? They aren't contributing into the society financially or a variety of other ways, right? They're, they're only taking. But the grace of God and the spirit of God is at work as it teaches us to sacrifice, to love, to give, to care, and not demand only that my things are for me and me alone. See, God says that the helpless are close to his heart so much so that there's a pretty strong command of judgment upon people that mistreat the widows and the fatherless. That he basically says, if you mistreat them, I'm going to make your wife a widow and your kids fatherless. And it's a scary reality, but it's the one-for-one one mentality, similarly with the ox, similarly in this scenario. God values these things. There is grace here for those that are of the least in society. See, there are many laws that we're not getting to this morning, but if we can see that God's laws speak to the image of God in each person, that restitution and making things right is a value, and the grace offered to the least, we will begin to see the heart of God in these laws of the people. When you hear these things, maybe like, what's your response? Like, how do you feel? Um, do you feel like cheated out of something? Do you feel like, maybe like, I'm, like, like I, I wish it was differently? I wish it went differently? Do you feel frustrated? Right, maybe you feel good. Maybe you're happy that God cares for things and people like he does. You see, we have lots of responses to the law, and it's normal, but we do have to wrestle with this reality as we look at other parts of Scripture, like Romans 3, as we see that there's no one that's righteous, not one. No one follows all of these laws. No one follows all the laws of God like we ought to. What do we do then? What do we do then? Well, like I remember growing up, um, I've shared this before, I was a bit of a rebellious child. I got myself into a lot of trouble. Um, and we had family rules, um, and I didn't like them. Uh, and sometimes I would break them. And we had a variety of ways to deal with said rule breaker. Um, and so a variety of things. So we would do things like um, timeouts. We'd do more chores, miss out on fun things. I'd miss out on plenty of fun things growing up. It was not my favorite experience. I'd get grounded, right? The goal was that crime would uh, match the punishment. But I, I mean, I pushed the limits a lot, so I got the full weight of all of the options. But when we break our family rules, there are consequences that are meant to help us see the value of the rules that are given and wanting to honor those that are giving them. And similarly with these laws too, when we break them to a degree, we're reminded that in breaking them, we're not just breaking a law, but beginning to cut away at the fabric the community, of the community of God that he is creating. Think about all that he's gone through just in Exodus to get to this point. And we begin to break that fabric of what he's doing and unraveling it when we break these laws. Yet even more so, there's another issue at play. When we break God's law, we are breaking our covenant promises to God. We talked about last week the Ten Commandments are like this covenant establishment with God. He's creating this covenant with us, and we're getting to see the stipulations. We're getting to see all of the uh, outworkings and inworkings of this with God and his people. And the laws then are the stipulations that we are expected to each fulfill. And so when we break them, uh, we might think that a natural consequence is to have our covenant or our contract tore up by God. He's not breaking them. We're breaking them. Think about like at your, your phone carrier, if you're Verizon or whatever, uh, and you say, my bill's $100, uh, but you say, I'm only paying 55 Like, that's all I'm paying. Uh, I don't know how long that contract uh, is going to stay or how long your phone will stay on. They have every right to terminate that contract. It's a broken contract. Yet, what we are talking about here is not our phones being shut off, but rather our standing with God. Like, when we break these laws, we essentially have no standing before God. We've lost it. 
And when we break them, we're in a very precarious, very, very difficult position with God. We're sitting uh, in a similar spot as that Exodus 22, verse 24, we talked about, about mistreating um, uh, fatherless and the widows, that the wrath of God is burning against us. That's a tough spot to be in. It's a tough spot. Yet this is how our relationship with God will be defined. If this is how it will be defined, we're constantly trying to live up to a standard that we're never going to attain. It's maddening, right? So how do these laws relate to our relationship with God? Our last question. So even after all these laws are laid out, with God being all-knowing and well aware of our inability to fulfill these laws and earn our righteousness, he invites Moses up to the mountain, right? He knows exactly what he's doing, and he invites Moses to come up to the mountain in chapter 24. Moses goes up to the mountain. The other elders wait for him there to return. And even in the midst of the great cloud and the thunder and the lightning and the glory of God shining and being there, God meets with Moses for 40 days, right? He's making a covenant again with Moses. He's renewing this. You will be my people. And God's saying, I will make you my people. And I will do it eternally that you might be my people. You see, and the other beautiful thing we see is that God is up there doing all these things on the mountain. He's not preparing to move farther away from us, though he has every right to do that. What he's doing is preparing Moses that he might actually come nearer to us which is what we see in the rest of Exodus, God making his dwelling with his people. Like that's what he's doing for these people who break all these laws, who break all the covenant. I'm actually going to move closer to you, God says. In verse 11, we see this beautiful kind of picture of what this might look like or what's going on. Uh, as, As the elders and Moses and the chief men of the people What did they do amidst all this thunder and lightning and all this craziness? They ate and they drank. They had a meal together. See, these meals are so central to who God is and to his community, his covenant people. It's this picture of beginning to make his dwelling with us. And the idea of eating and drinking together is central to the message of the whole of Christianity. You see, when we come to the Lord's table here, which we'll do in a minute, we're coming as those not put together, right? Right? Uh, not as those who are perfectly right, right? We are messed up. The song we sang, are you, are you tired? Are you overwhelmed? Are the burdens of life overwhelming you? Are you worn out? Are you exhausted? Is the weight of your sin burdening you? Jesus is calling. Come to him, right? See, that's when we come to here. We're coming as dependent ones that are fully knit, needing Jesus, We're coming as those needing Jesus, knit to him in his death, which the the law, God's law states is the punishment should fit the crime. When we break God's law, we deserve death. What did Jesus do? He died. The, The crime fits the punishment. And our rebellion, which deserves death, was attributed and executed on Jesus. But also we're dependent on him for our life. And because of his life, his life is like the righteousness and perfection, and his glorious obedience, fully living out the call of loving others and loving God, made in the image of God, fully giving himself as the actual mechanism and instrument for our salvation, as our restitution, if you want to think about it like that. He paid what we could never pay and lived righteously for us. But also his righteousness is so gracious to us because we could never earn even an ounce of what he did for us. But he freely gave it. You see, in closing, I want you to think about this scenario. I want you to think about the Golden Gate Bridge. I know you guys did not think I was going to say that, right? No one thought that. Zero. Think about the Golden Gate Bridge in California, right? It stretches over the Golden uh, Gate, this gate straight, rising 746 feet above the water, right? The Great Bridge is a wonder to behold. Ten different contractors it took to build this Great Bridge. Eleven people died by try- in, in, the, in the construction of it. And it was so dangerous that they made this giant net underneath it. Uh, and Nineteen people fell, would have fallen more to their death if they were caught in this net. They're called halfway to hell, 
That was their, they were part of the Halfway to Hell Club. That's a crazy name. But approximately 600,000 rivets hold each tower to the bridge. And a total cost today, if we were to rebuild that bridge, would be over $1.2 billion. It's crazy, right? It's crazy. But yet when we get in our cars and we drive across the bridge, we're suspended upon this bridge, we contribute zero, <laughs> right? We contribute zero to getting across this magnificent bridge, right? It's not about your car or anything like that. It's, a, it's the work of architects and iron workers and maintenance crews that make our trip across this wonderful bridge possible. You see, in the same way, we contribute nothing to God's gracious salvation to us. Christ alone spans the chasm of sin, spans the chasm of our broken covenants and our broken law and our broken rules and, and covenant and even the death that separates us from God. And so now, instead of these laws feeling like I have to earn something with God, now our life can be that of thankfulness, right? It can be that of gratefulness and gratitude. We can see these laws as opportunities to love God, to honor him, to bless him, uh, to serve him because he loves us, because he loves us deeply. So let's join together as we rest in Christ as our ultimate righteousness and salvation. And we seek to love God and love others, living out God's good laws for us. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this, your word. We thank you that your word is good to us. We thank you that your son Jesus is our righteousness and we don't have to earn anything with you because he has done it all. Lord, we thank you. and We ask that you'd help us to have faith uh, in him and that you'd continue to draw us ever more to yourself. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.